Hi, I'm Mark Richardson. I'm here with Anna Fialkoff at uh, Garden in the Woods today. And today we're looking at uh, some things to think about when you're selecting your plant palette for your garden. So we're going to take a walking tour through the garden and actually look at some of the plants that we really like to use in designs um, and talk about the specific attributes that make them, uh, I guess, worthy of selecting for our garden designs. And so the first plant we're talking about today is Itea. Um, and Anna, what is it about Itea that you really like? What are some of the things that you like about it in the, in the garden? I um, love this plant. It's really versatile and it works for a number of situations because it does well. This is a shady garden. It does well in some partial shade and it also does well in full sun. Yep. And it, you can see that it has prolific flowers, especially if it gets enough sun and southern exposure. Yeah. Um, also, it just has a large uh, time of seasonality. So it has, you know, its bloom time is in around mid-June or so. Um, and then it actually has really beautiful fall foliage with these the stems that start to turn a little bit reddish greenish in the fall and so the fall foliage is multicolored. I just love the way that it goes from green to pink to red um, and all on sometimes one leaf so it's um, it's a really make, makes a really nice low hedge as well. You can kind of prune it back and it suckers. I just love this plant for its versatility. You clearly love this plant. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that I really like about this plant is that it blooms during sort of a lull in the native uh, woodland garden. Um, you know, we're mid-June right now and there's not a ton blooming. Uh, and this one's just starting to come into flower. So it gives us that you know, sort of mid-season interest in early summer when we don't have a lot else blooming. And so it kind of mm -hmm. fills a gap that's really important. Mm -hmm. So another plant that we really like as a lawn alternative is Carex Pennsylvanica, uh, Pennsylvania Sedge. This is it right here. And also to my right is uh, the same plant that's been mowed. Um, this is a nice plant to use in situations where you want the look of a turf grass lawn, um, but you want something that's a little bit more sustainable than a turf grass lawn. Uh, does really well in uh, dry shade conditions, um, really doesn't need any fertilizer or, um, or moisture at all. Um, so in terms of using it in the garden, it's a great spot when you think you really want, you know, just a solid carpet of green, uh, where you think you might want something that looks like a turf grass lawn, but maybe it's in too much shade for turf grass. Uh, this is a really great alternative for that. It's a, it's a dense sort of mat forming um, sedge. It's not a true grass. Um, it just has a really, you know, a, um, a nice clean look for uh, a, a formal garden design setting like the one here in the Idea Garden. So one of my favorite plants in the garden is Jeffersonia diphylla. This is a uh, twin leaf. And what's really great about Jeffersonia is that it's got um, good blue-green foliage that just hangs out all season long. Um, I think most people think about its pretty fleeting um, floral display. It, you know, it blooms for like a day, maybe, if you're lucky. Um, but the foliage does hang around for a really long time. It looks good straight through the summer. Um, so for that spot in your garden where you just need something, um, you know, you need some coarse texture, uh, you need some foliage, you, you, you really want to um, have a long season of interest or at least, you know, a long period where the ground is covered um, in foliage, the, uh, Jeffersonia is a really good option. Um, the flowers, as I mentioned, are fleeting. They last for a very short amount of time. Uh, they are quite beautiful when, they, uh, when they're in bloom, but um, this is not a plant you're going to grow for a big floral display. It's really something that you're going to grow as an alternative to some of the you know, more foliage plants that we think about, like hostas, um, in the garden. So this is a, a really good plant for, um, for its foliage um, and has a, a nice blue-green color. So this is Aurelia racemosa, which is American spikenard. You can see that it's taller than me. Um, it's a plant that does, when the right conditions, get nice and large. Uh, it almost looks like a shrub, but it's actually an herbaceous perennial. So I think of it as serving a role as a mid-growing season herbaceous shrub-like plant that provides a lot of structure in the garden. Um, in the early season, it's a really nice thing to companion plant with early spring ephemerals like Virginia bluebells and celandine poppy and spring beauties, things like that that are fleeting. They're er they come up early in the season and um, then later the Aurelia racemosa can take up some of that prime real estate after those spring ephemerals go by. 
So it's a really beautiful plant. It has really nice layered structure. Um, it blooms in late June and has white poofy blooms uh, on a raceme, thus the name Aurelia racemosa. Then as they get pollinated, they start to produce little berries um, that all kind of come out in succession. So you'll have some red berries mixed with green berries and that's a really beautiful color contrast. As the berries start to develop more, they get really heavy and they bend down and kind of kiss the ground. So I think this plant has kind of a graceful quality. It provides structure in the garden and it's a great uh, plant to use in a woodland garden setting. Um, so here we have Cypripedium kentuckiense. This is one of our uh, showiest lady slippers in the garden. Um, this is actually a really good example of a plant that doesn't really offer a whole lot um, except for when it's flowering. Um, so it's an example of something that you'd want to add to a more mature garden. You're not going to build the structure of a garden around a uh, lady slipper. It's something that you're going to add as a, as a specimen, you know, in that perfect place in your garden. Um, but you really have to have an established garden before you can do so. Um, it's got, you know, very interesting flowers. This is sort of a sought-after prized plant. Um, but the foliage isn't all that spectacular. And once it's done blooming, uh, the foliage sort of peters out and, and, uh, and it, it, you know, becomes sort of an inconsequential piece of the garden. So great display of, of uh, a very interesting flower, really unique specimen in the garden, um, but not something you're going to build a garden around. This is Christmas fern, which um, get, gets its name because it's actually an evergreen fern. Um, its leaves will last through the winter. And it will get new fresh leaves in spring, but it's a really nice plant to have um, something green on the, on the ground year round. And it actually is a very nice structural uh, fern as well. It has nice broad leaves and it's very upright. So it does well mixed with other things that have more ephemeral um, times that they're um, nice during the growing season. So we have it mixed here with uh, bluets, um, other kinds of ferns, Thalictrums and uh, Cranesbill geranium. It also does really great in dry shade and that can be the toughest spot to plant in the garden. So I put it in my, my spots where nothing else will grow. So here we have the flame azalea, Rhododendron calendulaceum. Um, we're standing now in the Curtis Woodland Garden at Garden in the Woods, and we actually designed this garden with several species of rhododendrons to give us a very long extended bloom period. Um, nice thing about uh, these native azaleas is that they um, frequently bloom before the foliage comes out in the season. Um, so one of the other species that's no longer in bloom is rhododendron basii, which has pink flowers um, that come out pretty early in, in spring before the leaves start to come out. Um, and then the rhododendron vasii is followed by this plant, the flame azalea, rhododendron calendulaceum. Um, this one has a range of flower colors from uh, yellow to orange to red. Um, so one of the nice things about growing or uh, selecting this plant for your garden is if you buy one that's been grown from seed, you're never, uh, you know, you can never be guaranteed what color you'll get. So it's kind of a surprise, which is nice. Um, we also have a couple of other species of azalea that we highlight in the Curtis Woodland Garden. Uh, one that's about to bloom soon is uh, Rhododendron arborescens, and that one has very fragrant white flowers. Um, it's incredibly fragrant, almost overpowering, and that's something that I think people oftentimes overlook when they're selecting plants for their garden, is what kind of floral, you know, what kind of uh, uh, fragrance you're going to get. Um, and then we round out the season with Rhododendron prunifolium, the plum, plum leaf azalea, um, which gives us flowers into August and September. Um, so we really structured the garden design around these four species that give us a very long bloom season all throughout the year. This is umbrella leaf or diphyllea and it is a plant that has uh, interest throughout the whole growing season. When it's first coming up it um, looks kind of like it's emerging out of the ground like a fist coming out of the ground and it stays small for a little while as the spring ephemerals around it um, come through. It's a woodland plant so it does well in the shade but I've seen it also in part to almost full sun so um, it's versatile in that way. It also has really great 
textural quality. Um, it has really broad leaves. It looks almost tropical, which is something that you don't see a lot in the Northeast. It is a plant that's native to a little bit farther south, um, but it is hardy in the Northeast. And it's interesting through the seasons also because it gets flowers in um, early, late May to early June. And then after the flowers go by, it has really interesting fruits. Um, they're blue berries, kind of like a blueberry, but a little bit more round. And they're kind of on top of these stems, which turn really reddish as they mature. So it really creates a nice, interesting color contrast. So these, this plant is a really great textural plant, but it also provides a little bit of a pop of color. <laughs> Partridge berry or Michella repens is a plant that you would probably put in very particular spots in your garden. It's a little bit slow growing, but it is a ground cover and you'll find it in the woods in large masses, but it takes a long time if you plant it in a garden to get to that size. Um, I would strategically put this at a place that's at eye level so that you can see the detail of the flowers, which are a twin flower that are joined to get two flowers that are joined together at the base. And um, it's also fragrant. So being at eye level, being up close and personal with this plant is important. Um, and it's a great detail plant, something that you might put in after you've established your garden with all your structural plants, your layering, your plants that cover all the different seasons and all the colors that you're interested in, in the garden. This is Pycnanthemum tenuifolium, which is the slender leaved mountain mint. And in terms of aesthetics for the garden, I think it's a really great textural plant. It's um, gonna do well in full sun. It'll do well in dry areas. Um, so it, it does well in kind of a meadow-like scene. And um, it's also a plant that attracts a wide variety of pollinators. So I would call this a generalist species where it attracts um, all different types of solitary and honeybees and butterflies as well, as well as wasps. <laughs> mm. So I would plant this plant in an area that you don't mind kind of getting a little wild and untamed. It's a plant that is going to kind of cover the ground and spread. And that's a great quality because um, you want to stabilize that ground and get it covered so that the weeds don't come up between them. Um, I would plant it with plants like New England um, Liatris, um, New England Blazing Star, Goldenrods. Um, I would plant it with Baptisia australis, which is um, a wild indigo or Baptisia tinctoria, which is yellow wild indigo. Um, other plants you can plant it with are milkweeds, which are host plants to the monarch uh, butterfly caterpillars, and a number of other meadow species. One of the things you always want to think about when designing a garden is having varying heights and different textures um, in combination together. So here we have my favorite plant name, Arctostaphylos uva ursi, the bearberry. Um, bearberry is a really good ground cover. It works well in both kind of more naturalistic and also very formal garden design settings. Um, bearberry is very salt tolerant. It's, uh, it's incredibly heat and um, dry soil tolerant. It really needs well-drained soils. It won't do well unless it has very well-drained soils. Um, and the bearberry is sitting right next to a, a great contrasting plant, little blue stem. Um, so you can see the, the uh, texture of the foliage is much different on little blue stem. It's also going to get quite tall. This will be 18 to 24 inches in just a few, few more weeks. And so you can see that height difference between the bearberry and the little blue stem that it's planted next to. So over on this side of the bed, we can see we have Asclepias tuberosa and the little blue stem that we were looking at just a second ago. Uh, Asclepias tuberosa, or butterfly weed, is a really important host plant for uh, the monarch butterfly. has great orange uh, flowers, um, and again, varying um, uh, height with uh, little blue stem and, and different texture to the foliage. And then behind us, we have Morella. Caroliniensis, uh, which is the uh, bayberry. This used to be Myrica pennsylvanica. 
Um, it, what I really like about Morella is that it's got great uh, um, scent, great fragrance or aroma to the foliage. Um, it's semi-evergreen, although in New England it pretty much loses all of its leaves. Um, has really good glossy texture or glossy uh, foliage. Um, and again, does really well in sort of dry, um, poor soils. Uh, it's a good plant for a parking lot or along a roadway where it will get some salt spray over the winter. Um, and it gets pretty tall. I've seen this as, as much as 8 to 10 feet. Um, and, but it has uh, you know, really nice texture, really nice foliage. Uh, and great fragrance. I always love to run my hands along the leaves and just and, and grab a whiff of that. It's got great fragrance.